for the record, I'm Ken Schatz. I'm the Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. I know uh, Reva Murphy, the Deputy Commissioner for Child Development Division, will come along shortly. I do appreciate the opportunity to talk about S40, and I'll, what I thought I would do is give you sort of a fairly brief statement, but try to then respond to whatever questions you have. Mm -hmm. You know, but to be clear, um, we as the Department for Children and Families are not taking a position with respect to S40 and whether or not there should be an increase in the minimum wage, but we did participate um, uh, on the uh, Senate side in the development of their legislation mm -hmm. to respond to, I think, an issue that you understand, I expect, quite well, that there is an impact in terms of the so-called benefits cliff or benefits slope. So we have done a lot of work over the past couple of years with the Joint Fiscal Office um, to, to work on that issues on that issue, both with respect to our economic service division programs, reach up, lie heat, three squares, but also child care. Uh, and the, uh, I think, and you may have already heard from the Joint Fiscal Office, I'm, I'm not sure of the order in which you've taken testimony, but Deb Wrighton has done a lot of work analyzing the, the impacts of increasing the minimum wage with respect to those programs. Uh, to be straightforward, the eligibility levels for a public assistance program is really very low. Um, so that if, if a person is even under the present minimum wage levels, working full time, they're not going to be eligible for reach up, um, our major public assistance safety net program. We do have sliding fee scales, though, with respect to LAHEAP and three squares. And certainly, if the minimum wage is uh, increased, there would be some impact uh, with respect to people receiving somewhat less benefits under those programs. But being straightforward, we do have, with your support, created several programs, particularly in RECHA, to try to reduce the impact of when people get wages. Specifically in the Reach Up arena, we have created a Reach Ahead program, which is specifically enables people to um, have a, uh, a, a an offset so that we don't count some the, the uh, wages that they start to earn um, towards their reach reach up benefits so we protect people who are just re-entering the job uh, market in that way we also do our best to provide uh, child care for people with high subsidy levels for people who are in reach up so the, the most significant impact with respect to the DCF array of services regarding increasing the minimum wage is with respect to child care. Because there's no question that we do hear about individuals now who talk about uh, if they go and get a job and they have, or they have a job and they get a proposed raise, they've got to do the financial analysis about whether or not they're really going to be taking home more money or not uh, at the end of the day after paying for childcare. And I'm going to sort of do the, the general. Uh, make the general point, which again, I expect you're familiar with, but we have tremendous challenges in our child care system in terms of access and affordability. I'm not going to go into that in great depth. The Blue Ribbon Commission report um, lays that out in great detail, but we really have, uh, to be clear, major challenges. As you know, we put out information as part of the uh, budget, um, unfunded expenses report, clarifying what it would take to um, uh, bring up our child care provider reimbursement rate. Uh, to, right now, we're at 2008 levels. In order to bring that up to 2015 levels, it would cost approximately $9.2 million. To bring it up to 2017 market rate, it would cost a total of $15 million. Obviously, that's an incredible challenge. That, and we do have a sliding fee scale for families, but the point is, even if you're at 100% of the sliding fee scale, because of that disparity that I mentioned regarding our reimbursement to child care providers, child care providers, in order to maintain a viable business, need to require a copay, if you will. That is, families need to, in addition to whatever subsidy they get from DCF, they also need to pay out of pocket 
that has become a tremendous challenge for many families as is um, in our system right now. We've talked about that in various committees in various ways. Again, the Blue Ribbon Commission talks about it at great length. Um, I will say we did just to put it out there quickly, you know, the federal government uh, just passed a budget for federal fiscal year 18. Um, we did. We do expect to receive $2.8 million, which is obviously helpful. But again, I, I want to give you the scale. $2.8 million is helpful, but it doesn't get us to 2015, even if market rate, uh, as you may, uh, market rate levels, as you may remember, in the budget that you passed last year, you did allocate um, basically $2.2 million additional money. We did target that money to programs that had high percentages of children with subsidy to try to frankly address the most uh, needy and vulnerable families and child care providers because we appreciate those providers who take in um, families with children with subsidies. So I, I give you that broad brush to let you know that there is a, a, a major challenge for us as, as a state, as a community. The work that we did going to S40 specifically with the uh, Senate side, and it's reflected in, in section two of the legislation, was to, in effect, try to um, keep families uh, harmless if, in fact, the minimum wage uh, increase, as proposed, was passed. So the idea would be we came up with this language to uh, reflect that we would address both components of our system to adjust the sliding fee scale, to correspond with any minimum wage increase that would occur over time, and then we would adjust the market rate so that we would continue uh, to at least not make the situation for child care providers any worse. The language is here is uh, to the extent funds are appropriated. Um, being straightforward, as a, as a public steward, we needed to say, and I appreciate this Senate including that language, that obviously if we're given the um, mandate to adjust the sliding fee scale or the market rate, we need to have the funds to, to do that. We are um, in the process of, we've been asked by the Senate also to do some calculations about how much would it cost, um, because again, as you may recall from the, from the legislation, um, there is an increase under this legislation that would begin on, uh, on uh, January 1st, 2019, um, and so we have calculated uh, that cost, and, and Reba will have a little better information than me, but to give you a sense of the scale, it's roughly uh, something less than a million dollars. Um, obviously, the federal money could help with that, to be sure. But um, so the bottom line is that I um, appreciate the fact that uh, the Senate did look at this issue, did look at the issues related to uh, the benefits cliff, the benefits slope, and did uh, wanted to enable families that if they did, uh, and uh, if we did pass a minimum wage increase and there was a benefit in terms of increased salary, that at least we would not put either families or child care providers into an even deep, deeper hole than we already are in. But again, as you can tell, I think from my comments, it's, it's still a major challenge uh, to have a child care system uh, that is really responsive to the needs of, of our families here. So let me stop there and hope I've given you a general picture, but glad to do my best to answer questions and I'll be straightforward with you. You know, uh, we, I apologize again, Reva's not here, but I will certainly take back any questions and make sure I get your answers to them if I don't know them. Okay. Uh, Representative Smith. So you're in the child care financial assistance program. Uh, who do you see couples? You know, you've got a family with, with a child or two. Are these, are these families that are in their 19 and 20 year olds, or are they 30 year olds? Uh, you know, I don't have that demographic, demographic picture. I will ask, I mean, uh, again, that's one of those things I'm going to uh, check on to be sure, but I think it's, it, 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 I think think it's, it covers the range. I don't, it's certainly not limited to young families. I mean, I don't want to necessarily get into it too deeply here, but to be candid, one of the pressures on our system is actually related to the opioid epidemic. Because again, you may have heard me talk about it in other contexts, we have had a substantial increase 
in the number of children coming into state custody in our child welfare system because of the opioid epidemic. One of the things we provide is, and many of those are very young children because they are those young families, to yeah. be candid, who are oftentimes affected by opiate addiction. And one of the things that we provide, and it's good timing because you can help me out here, but I think one of the things that, um, one of the things that we provide is we do provide 100% of the child care payment for children who are in Family Service Division custody so that um, we don't ask them to make co-payments. So we do our best to protect them uh, in, in our current system. So, so the, the question, I'll give you a chance to catch your breath, but uh, uh, the, the, the question was uh, the demographics of the uh, families who receive uh, CCFAP funding. Are they primarily young young families, or, or how does that break out? And I acknowledge that I didn't know the answer to that. Well, we don't know age of parents. We do know age of children. And about a third of the children are actually school-age children. And the rest are infants and toddlers and preschoolers. So it's not quite even. Preschoolers are a little higher than the other populations. But we have a significant number of school-age children participating in subsidy. So that would put parents in the mid-20s range, probably. Mm -hmm. Mid-20s, um, early 30s, yeah. We, yeah. Don't have, we have income demographics about the families. We don't have age demographics. We don't ask the parents yeah. their age. I will say some of us married a little later in life, so that uh, when my children were school age, I was in my 30s. But yeah, you know, I think it varies, of course. So I think the point being is you can't pinpoint the age. But. Thank you. Probably for our infants and toddlers, you can make some assumptions about the age of the parents, but not entirely. Mm -hmm. Representative Strong, can you mention the um, benefits like Reach Up, Three Squares, Line Deep Child Care, and then you mentioned Reach Ahead? Yes. Um, could you just briefly tell us what Reach Up does cover and then what the Reach Ahead is? I've heard about that. Sure. So, Reach Up is our basic public assistance program for families that. Um, uh, uh, where there are children and where there is uh, uh, basically no income uh, or enough, because essentially the reach up guidelines, and I could give you that data if you're interested in, are very low for eligibility. So we provide, we actually have a, a population in reach up that is, you can sort of roughly break out in thirds. Some of them are only children, so, so that the parents may not be eligible by themselves, but the children might be disabled. And, uh, and so we have a child only population. We have a population where families are involved in reach up because there's a disability um, or of the parent, and so they are unable to work. And then we have a third category where we have families with children where, for whatever reason, they are not currently working, but we have a, we are work, we, they may still be eligible, but we have a plan to work with them to gain employment. That third category over the last three years, and probably not a surprise to you, has been actually significantly decreasing because with our low unemployment rate, in fact, we are um, seeing a lot of families successfully gain employment and moving off of the reach-up program. As you may know from our budget, we've seen millions of dollars decrease in our reach-up budget because of people successfully moving into the economy. Now, there's other challenges, and you, you know this committee has talked about housing and homelessness because oftentimes, and this relates to the benefit cliff, oftentimes these families get low-paying jobs, so they're not eligible for, for reach-up anymore, but honestly, they're one paycheck away from being homeless, so that's part of the challenge. But the Reach Ahead program was created a few years ago with the legislative support and the idea being, as people do obtain jobs, rather than having a hard and fast cutoff, we wanted to make it more of an economic or benefit slope rather than a cliff. Mm -hmm. So the idea is we have what I referred to earlier, the earned income disregard, meaning that I think that I think it's the first $250 <coughs> that people earn on a monthly basis, we don't count so that they still could get reach up benefits mm -hmm. as they earn uh, income in a job to enable them to make a transition uh, to full independence. And, then, and we do also have a connection to the child care program to enable those uh, working parents to have child care. Oh, yes. Thank you. Sure. Is there a time limit on, on uh, how long the $150 is disregarded? I believe it is. I, I want to check to be sure whether I say it's one or two years, but um, I'll, I'll check on that. 
uh, Representative Reed. Um, thank you very much. The uh, the, the copay, um, which I'm sure varies by provider, is is that you know kind of on a, a median or mean basis? Like Five dollars, ten dollars, twenty. I mean, well, I'll let Reva answer that. So the the, the copay is actually it could be two parts. Just so in the sliding question. fee scale that we oh. that we establish. The sliding fee scale yeah. that we establish is based on family size, income, and the percent of the state rate that that the family has access to. So it, when our rates are robust, a family who has 100 percent benefit would not necessarily have a copay. Um, the problem is our rates are behind. Uh, our, uh, if you guys already mentioned that, and so we are not keeping pace with what the provider charges. Providers are permitted to charge the difference, and that difference has been growing over time. So the copays could be substantial. A family with 100% um, benefit, according to our calculations, could have as much as $2,000 a year that they have to pay in addition to a 100% benefit for subsidy. Um, and that's substantial for a family who's earning at that level. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Some providers forgive that. We actually have a grant program that we have that, um, uh, that uh, requires providers to accept it to take 100% families at no copay, the Strengthening Families Grant Program. And so those are providers who are serving a lot of our kids and they're using resources to yeah not charge them copay even though they're four and five stars um, but but then as families go up the income scale we just can't protect them all of that time because providers couldn't stay in business and as it is providers get a little bit stuck in the middle of our rate and wanting to serve families and knowing families can't af afford it. So, so so if the provide it's 100 percent the providers call if they want to do it yes or not. Oh, okay beyond our copayment it's a, it, you know whether or not they're charging parents mm -hmm. Um, to reach there. And some providers have their own scholarship programs that augment our programs, so providers make those decisions themselves. Thank you. How many providers have 100% of, of their participants um, involved in the program? None of our providers have 100%. Well, Head Starts might be pretty darn close. Though not all of the Head Start families are participating in CCFAP because they're not all, they don't all have service need. They're not all working. So we have, for providers who are non-Head Start providers, we have a few who are up at 90% of our kids. We don't have anybody at 100%. Mm -hmm. And then that uh, tapers off pretty quickly. We, we could give you a spreadsheet of that because that's, partially how we calculate the early care and development grants. So we actually have a spreadsheet so we know exactly who's at the top and how that goes down. Uh, Representative Stevens. So can you just give us an idea of the numbers that we're talking about with respect to salaries in terms of what's 100, I mean, we have, we've seen charts about what's 100% poverty for all different family sizes, but do those numbers ever change? It, I mean, they're, they're mostly federal numbers. Sometimes we make adjustments, um, like in health care uh, or health insurance. And so I'm just curious, how, how do you make adjustments to what those poverty levels are? Uh, it, I mean, this sounds like you know, what the earned income disregard is, is about. But from if we did the math on a $15 minimum wage, we're talking about $31,000 a year, which is above the family of four at two hundred percent or whatever you know whatever the numbers are just so how do you manage these numbers back and forth to try to keep um, to, to try to keep people who need these benefits receiving them right now so right now um, pretty much the last yep. few years we've been able to adjust it's not in law that we adjust automatically every year but we've been able to find the resources every year to adjust to the federal poverty level so that our federal poverty, um, le our sliding fee scale right now is based on the federal poverty levels for 17 and we're building in to adjust to 2018. And that ripples through a little bit. The thing I will tell you is that the sliding fee scale is fairly granular. So that um, adjustments in income, uh, like people go from 100% to 99% benefit to 98%, you know, like, so in the beginning, the co-pays that we assign are very small. It's really the difference between the rate and the copay that um, 
that makes the difference. And on our sliding fee scale, what we've observed at the times we've been able to really do a little research on it is that it's at about 150% of poverty where, um, where, it be, where our assigned copay becomes a little unaffordable. The fact that the rates aren't up or absent that, that, it, that there's a bit of a cliff inside the sliding fee scale because at that point you reach about a 50% benefit and what we've observed is that less than a 50% benefit um, doesn't generally keep, a, with all their other costs, doesn't generally keep families um, able to afford uh, childcare. And so they make a, a lot of other arrangements. Some families will use subsidy for part of their childcare and make other arrangements for other parts. We try to be flexible with that so that if a family can get into high quality childcare for three days, three 10 hour days, which is 30 hours, and that's a full time rate, if they can get that with no copay from a provider and make other arrangements for two days, that's, we let them make those arrangements to try to use our resources to, to fit their needs. Um, what the Blue Ribbon Commission um, on Access to Affordable High Quality Childcare um, calculated was, um, we looked at the livable wage data in Vermont and we looked at where, um, where people paid all their other expenses and we took childcare out of the equation and said like at that point, that's, people need 100% support up until that, you know, theoretically people would need 100% support up until they reach that point where they have a dollar above rent, all other things to pay for childcare. And then we looked at if you went up the scale, um, at what point would families be able to afford the rate themselves? So that was kind of the calculations that they used there to think about how, how could the sliding fee scale mitigate a cliff. And so are you saying that those numbers are based um, those calculations are based on numbers that are gross income or is it net income? It's gross income. We do have some um, some things that are excused, um, but we don't use net income. There are just some things that are not counted, like savings account for education for your kids isn't, if you put money aside there, that's not counted, but we don't use a net income, we use a gross income. Questions? Just one more. Yeah. So, who should we talk about with um, in AHS about the um, the other sections of, of where minimum wage is going to get it may affect, like the AAAs or the um, or any of the other agencies that don't fall under your um, bailiwick in terms of if the salary goes up and we're sending this money out to these agencies, will services be cut? So my recollection, and, and, and Deb Brighton would have more specific knowledge, was the other major impact, aside from our programs, is actually Medicaid, um, uh, in that it would affect, again, with increased income, it, it might affect eligibility for Medicaid. Uh, and that's, so that would be a diva, uh, diva question. But again, I think that um, Deb Brighton may have that information. And then we had a presentation last year from Deb and, and Paul Dragon. Right. And Paul Dragon is with the Secretary's Office, and in some respects, you know, if you wanted a larger presentation, we, we've we got that in terms of the general issues regarding the benefits, because it isn't necessarily tied to this legislation. I did, I did not, I didn't, one of the things that Reva's asking me about is uh, child care wages, and I didn't really talk about that other than to say that, and it's, it's worth saying that obviously uh, the child care workers will be significantly impacted by an increase in minimum wage. Uh, obviously it already is in state law, but if you pass S-40, um, frankly, child care workers are some of the lowest paid uh, workers in the state, and that you know, we'll have some impact. It will have impact on those rates for Jason. Right. That was my question. Oh, right. <laughs> no. I must have. No, no, I, I, uh, <laughs> since we took testimony yeah, uh, last, well, yeah. Jason, but, mm -hmm. yeah. um, since we had taken testimony um, earlier this week uh, from the providers, 
uh, it's um, it's interesting that effect, and they did uh, reflect on uh, the their impact, and then the rate of support that their clients would have, their families <coughs> you know, would have, and how that would uh, you know interface. You know, so being you know cognizant of that, um, I think it's really critical that we kind of balance that and take a very clear look, you know, at how that's going to affect things. Mm -hmm. So maybe having those broader numbers or at least some projections, you know, looking out at, uh, you know, 24, what might that look like? You know, so that, you know, as you're planning, uh, you'd be able to. Yeah, it's, I do appreciate that question. I think this is one of those things that we, and we did talk a fair amount about this in the Senate. We don't have that capacity within DCF to do that kind of projection based on the labor force. We don't know what, uh, what individual child care providers pay to their staff. So there's, an, there's some average data in Department of Labor, but it's average. So for us to try to model how many would have to raise their wages, um, presumably, the people who have higher wages now will raise their wages again because they do that to attract staff. And mm -hmm. one of the things we're hearing a lot about lately is we also have a bit of a child care capacity problem here. We're hearing that providers are, finding, are having trouble finding staff. Mm -hmm. um, and when we talk to our friends at um, the Commerce Department, at the Labor Department, they're like, everybody's having trouble um, finding staff. And if you're an industry that has some of the lowest wages, you are having more trouble. So when we think about, reflect on that is, um, what's, ca you know, what's causing this like real providers are sort of closing classrooms for lack of staff. And we've been curious if it had something to do with the qualifications we've put in. But the problem is they're not finding any humans. <laughs> Never mind humans who are qualified or not qualified. They're getting zero applicants. And, and some of that, uh, when we talk to our friends at labor and commerce who are looking across industries, they're like, every low-paying industry is having that problem right now. You guys are just competing hard for that, and we're trying to make sure that the people who are taking care of the kids are well qualified. So it's a bit of a perfect storm right now. Representative Stevens. How many people receive, um, or families receive 100% uh, we have about 8,000 families overall who are receiving subsidies, and uh, it's, what's that? It's at about approximately 4,000. Approximately 4,000 are receiving 100% subsidy. And again, it's pretty granular. So if you look at who are receiving, um, who are in that less than 150, you know, <clears throat> receiving more than a 50% benefit, that's pretty much 85% of our population, right? Is towards the bottom. And how many children do that, does that work? It's actually 8,000 children. Oh, so okay. that's 6,000 oh, okay. that's families. I was, I okay. took that out of my head and not off your chart. Okay, good. <laughs> so it's 6,000 so families. And that would be 4,000 4, so families. So it's 4,000 families. Okay. Ken's chart is families. So it's 4,000 families out of 6,000 are at 100%. About 66% or so are at 100%. And that includes our protective services kids, reach out. Reach Out Protective Services um, are, are, have a categorical eligibility for 100%. Other folks, it's based on income. Sorry, I'm still struggling a little bit to make sure I have the families versus the children Sorry. number right. Uh, the number of, of children overall receiving? Um, it's so about 8,000. About 8,000. Um, and of those, 4,000 are receiving 100%? No, that's the 4,000 is the family. So there's about 6,000 okay. families, about 4,000 are 100% something. Those families, uh, the average is, I think, two point something children. But some have one.
as well, best we can. Understood. So you just, you started with saying you had worked with the Senate on this language. That's right. So that's, um, we did appreciate that opportunity to talk about how, if the minimum wage was increased as provided in S40, how would we deal with this problem that we've been talking about to at least not exacerbate it? That is, I don't want to suggest this is going to solve it, but at least wouldn't make it worse. Um, if we did get some additional funds and for each benefit, I'll share, I told them that it was approximately a million dollars. Um, we would be, make these adjustments with respect to the changes that are proposed in the bill for fiscal year 19. So don't hesitate to let us know if as you go forward you want us to come back. We appreciate the complexity here. So we're glad to provide more information as needed. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Thank you. So this is all we have for today that we want to talk about next week. Um, we have to read one of you, if you would, talk to us about what you have. And thank you again, Ken. Sure, you're welcome. Thank yeah, you. Thank you for being here. Um, and we're doing our best to allocate some resources there. We're just going to have a lot of extra ones that we have to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Clearly, an industry that needs more, if, if you can call it an industry, it's not really a sector that needs more um, uh, support. take about a five minute break while you load up and we think about getting um, asking Deanna to come back in. Do you need some do you need some time Ron or are you No, I'm okay. Good. I'm, I'm good. I'm just, okay. just waiting for this to find me for it's Resolution circulating around. Oh, yeah, I need to sign it. Yeah. It's here. Is there anybody who hasn't signed it that would like to? Um, I think that, uh, the, they, uh, they, they, since they lost their funding to uh, to be part of UVM's extension, that they haven't been as communicative with us about mm. what that day looks like. They will be on the floor for the reading of the resolution, um, but I'm not aware of anything more that they're suggesting that we be a part of. Uh, following caucuses and lunch, we'll be back in committee around 1 o'clock. We have scheduled Tom Cadet to come back in for our request. He requests that if you have questions for him to address, he would dearly love hearing them in advance so that he can prepare for them. So, you want to spend some time today or communicate with him? Yeah, no, let's stop right now. Do people have questions that they that they can off the top that they can think of that they have for Tom? Anybody got something to Coach. All right, let us know if you come up with anything. We'll ask him to go through his recommendation. We didn't really do that. Um, 
the other day, or his evaluation of the. Did you get Evaluation or recommendation? Well, a recommendation. It's probably a better way for Uh, following uh, Tom, who I believe has to be out the door by around 2 or so, uh, maybe a little later, 2.30, uh, we have um, a twice delayed uh, hearing on H127. Representative Stevens, do you want to say anything about that? Or? Uh, it's, it's a tough little bill, but the, the self-advocate is constituent of mine has been asking to get a hearing on this bill. He has COPD and he lives in a condominium and smoking is allowed in the public areas of condominiums and it bugs him because the smoke comes into his apartment or his condo and there's no, what makes it difficult is that our statutes don't really get into condo law. Condo laws are almost self-standing little countries amongst themselves. And um, but he's been wanting to share this. Um, this is the second biennium we put this bill forward, and it was next door for one biennium, and now it's here. We just I just want to be able to make sure he has an opportunity to tell his story. And it's in the same category as what. Representative Myers' bill, the really is the you know with the gardening and condo mm -hmm. public areas. This mm -hmm. is you know it's frustrating for people mm -hmm. who don't. It, well, it would be frustrating for me to go into some place and realize that you can't change the bylaws easily, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so he's just asking us to take a look to see if we can help with that. So uh, it's anticipated uh, that will take no more than a half hour, and. Uh, May schedule something else before the end of the day. Mm -hmm. okay. that's, that's Tuesday. Wednesday, we start the morning uh, back to minimum wage. You can see we have uh, an array of witnesses. Some of these are the folks coming back that we had to send away yesterday because the floor ran mm -hmm. long. So mm -hmm. we have reserved room 10, just, just to make it a little physically a little more comfortable for folks. I don't, don't know at this moment if there'll be additional names on that list yet or not. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see there are a couple of folks that are still in the invited category. Maybe they haven't confirmed. Yeah. So uh, afternoons uh, still be scheduled. Uh, some of that has to do with the ever-present uncertainty of floor time. As to where you know, that. in general, I, you know, I probably shouldn't say this, famous less words, but <laughs> I, in general, I expect it's going to be a fairly a light floor week next week. Let me help you out with that. <laughs> 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 I expected yesterday <laughs> about the floor. Did <laughs> anybody have information to the contrary? If I look forward to it, it will be on the screen. Yeah. That would be great. Nothing was on notice, I don't no, 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 no. A lot of stuff left by. Okay. All right. So moving on to what, Thursday. So you just saw that little email pop on my my screen. Apparently, the Senate was planning on voting on uh, S55 this afternoon. Yeah. Let's get out of here before they do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so Wednesday afternoon to be determined. Uh, Thursday, same idea, although we're, at the moment anyway, we're here in this room um, taking testimony on uh, short term rental S204. Um, Boy, that is a lot of people to have in this room. Yeah, really. <laughs> well, I'll Can you check on Ethan Allen? I, I can work on that. Can we find a short term rental something? <laughs> 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 or a few hours. <laughs> so uh, as you can see it's a it's a mixture of folks. Uh, there are a lot of people, a lot of entities that have an interest in the subject. 
Right. Yeah. We're getting. Fun time <laughs> <laughs> but we've been in touch a lot. And we're, no, we're, and we're getting some interesting comments too. So I right. encourage I encourage folks mm -hmm. um, to to take a look at the comments that are posted on the website, including the report of the of the um, working group. Which Katie may have touched on in her in her She alluded to it. Yeah. Alluded to so a, a reminder to members: public comment that comes, I post it to attach it to dates of hearings. So we had a hearing two days ago. So anything I got around then, I posted to them. Things that are coming in now, I'm posting to that date to this date. So you won't be able to see it until that date. Um, but if anyone ever wants a printout of all the public comments, they can generate that very easily. But you can also call it up by just the bill number, right? Correct. Okay. You can do that. You can find it that way as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you see, we have the town manager from Stowe called this morning, uh, seeking, uh, <laughs> and uh, we have, there seems to be a. Bubbling a measure from Brattleboro. So, <laughs> Stephanie Bonin is a place um, holder right now while she figures out who exactly might come and testify. Uh, the, then we uh, switch gears back to minimum wage. Those uh, two folks were, um, were among the folks we had to send away yesterday, and uh, they couldn't come on Wednesday. So, Thursday's uh, their only day available. Again in the afternoon, um, we don't have anything scheduled yet. There's a thought that we would break by around 3, 3.30 before we reconvene at 5.30 for the public hearing. There was some thought maybe of a committee meal. Yeah, I think that would be great to do before yeah, the end of the nice session. And it may be, t I, I don't know whether it's possible to do it that day. Um, but Not I so much for you. Oh. Or are you not? Will you not be here? No. Oh, that's right. He'll be retiring from his Gatorade dinner. I'm getting siphoned. Oh. Okay. Uh, right. And then uh, Friday. Oh. Uh, I'm getting big C that ain't cancer. When you ready have dinner? And has been as has been our 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 nature this year. Friday remains unscheduled until we see how the progresses. Well, undoubtedly, time wasting to fill it. Less than a time. Uh, minimum wage, short term rentals. <laughs> minimum wage, short term rentals. Minimum wage, short term rentals. Okay, cool. Let's get this set up for you. Yeah, we have a 71 today as well. Did they tag it? Did they tag it? They tagged us seven to nine. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. 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 They in the version of page 771 that passed second reading yesterday. So it's, um, if you take, if you take the section on appointment by the governor from H744, but leave out anything about appointment by the governor and just put in uh, qualifications for the adjutant general. So it doesn't have anything, it still leaves election with the legislature. That section has been added with all the other technical cleanup changes that were in there, mm -hmm. and the qualifications for the adjutant. Uh, is section two of page seven seventy one, section one, which is the study, just had a, a <coughs> very small technical change asking for the total number of guard members, um, in addition to all the various information pieces about ranks and promotion and so forth. Um, just so that there's some baseline information so you know, okay, we're talking about out of 10,000 people, there are 300 sergeants and, you know, this many are men and this many are women. So, um, and so S17, again, does just the criteria? Does just the criteria leaves, for the adjutant general leaves. and leaves the election as it is now. Whereas, so. whereas 774... 744 transfers the election of the adjutant general to the, or transfers the, changes the adjutant general from an elected by the legislature position to an appointed by the governor position. With the criteria and a recent.
research process similar to judicial review? Uh, yeah, it's been a while since I've looked at that bill, but yeah, there is there is some process, I think. Um, I'd have to look at it closely again. I don't know if it, it's not the committee process that this committee passed in the last biennium. So I, I so think there, there are criteria. So the, the Senate bill is silent on that. It, it doesn't. It leaves it, it leaves it with the legislature. So it, as, it specifically. As the status quo. Yeah, it specifically references um, filing, submitting your candidacy to the Secretary of State for the legislative mm -hmm. election. So, um, yeah. Um, okay. So um, they're acting on that today. Yeah, passed second reading yesterday. Okay. It should pass third reading today. It was a voice vote yesterday, so I just don't anticipate uh, any holdups today. It's very disappointing that the Senate has not acted on our um, actions on. Is it during in two bienniums now? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. To to change the selection process. We started after General Craig was elected. Yeah. Very very So you passed the same thing three times. Not not that exactly. Actually, we agreed. I think we agree on establishing the baseline criteria for candidates. Um, but we were concerned about the sort of o completely wide open election of the adjutant general and the, gen and the general assembly. And we, um, after much work with some members of the Judiciary Committee, um, came up with a review process that's kind of um, it has it's part judicial retention, part judicial nominating, where there's a group of people, appointed people who review candidates, and um, giving the candidates an opportunity to speak, giving citizens an opportunity to speak, and um, then bringing forth any names mm -hmm. that meet the basic criteria to the general assembly for uh, uh, for approval. An election, mm -hmm. um, and just to kind of repeat some of the history that brought that on, if I might, <laughs> when the when there was last a contested election, which is was about a little over five years ago now, um, there was a uh, a citizen who was who ex privately somewhat quietly expressed concerns initially about one of the candidates uh, who was her superior officer who did not respond to her complaints about uh, her supervisor's sexual assault of her. And we were fluxed about how to, how to process this, given this um, process in which there, there was no committee vetting of candidates at all. Um, and um, because she didn't have a way to, to add way in and this respected officer didn't have a way to to really weigh in other than through the press. And we yeah we didn't have that process. Hmm? We just we just didn't have a mm -hmm. process built into this election. So right now it's it, it's the same at this point. What and, and the Senate is not <clears throat> Apparently, not recommending a change in the election. In the election, just process. the criteria. Mm -hmm. Just the criteria, which I think is important. But mm -hmm. I think the election itself is important as well. Mm -hmm. And we are the last, or the only state. I won't say last, but we are the only state that elects an adjutant general using this well, using any process. They're all appointed. It's it's not it's not simple. Um, uh, so I 
suggest we think about it and we'll have to find a way to come back to it next week after the sentence decision. Final decision. Um, there's another issue we wanted to bring up before we leave, and that is a, a resolution that was introduced that we heard a, a, a brief um, introduction of actually before our break. That's JRH 12. Um, a joint resolution urging Congress to establish a system of checks and balances for a decision to launch a nuclear attack. People remember that? I yeah. think it was Mary Sullivan who came in mm -hmm. on it. I think it's in pretty good hands right now. <laughs> I actually disagree. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Don't you, Helen? Actually, no. <laughs> You're on your own, right? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Good luck. laughs> Is there interest in it? How, we have to do testimony? How do, you, how do you handle a resolution like that? Do we do testimony or what? Uh, we certainly could. Mm -hmm. we talk about what that looks like. It's a purely subjective thing. I know. I, I could would you get? Yeah. Well, I, mean, I imagine um, I'm thinking about a news article that I read about the the, uh, the current setup of powers around the nuclear um, codes and um, and that that might be, you know, in terms of uh, testimony of getting someone to talk about that, what the current process is. Um, and this particular article that I heard um, also talked about the, the history of it, of why it's there and, um, and how unique it is um, and the impacts of it. Um, and that really, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. But that might be in terms of testimony so that we can understand how things are, are currently laid out. Is it just a decision of the president right now? Or the president, the speaker of the house, no, and it's, the it's, secretary it's of state? Just, it's just the president. And um, and uh, has and even um, questioning that has um, had people lose their military positions, um, just asking for some checks and balances um, around that. So um, it's really, um, it's under the current current structure, no one is legally able to stop the president from um, sending nuclear weapons um, at any point to anywhere. There's no, there's no legal able to stop that. Shocked if in the last year they didn't install some sort of safety, stop safety measure. And at the at the federal level, there there have been bills to try to change this, um, but that really right now, legally, there's nothing to stop the president from sending a nuclear weapon anywhere at any time. And I know I'm repeating myself at this point, but um, people have lost their military careers just for just for asking about it. So, so. Uh, Is it just a, like when we do a town meeting where everybody puts a non-binding resolution like a and, on it and nothing happens? Or, I mean, well, what it, happens with something like that? It, um, well, technically for this body, the fact that it was sent to us rather than going directly to the floor means that it comes back to the floor. It's treated as a bill. Um, and um, it would, if passed, would be advisory. We can't um, specifically direct Congress to right. take action. That, that was my question. What, what's the what's the upshot of it? Sometimes if you bring something to the president's attention and pays attention to it, that could be a problem. Cool. <laughs> or what? I could do this? Yes. I never knew how to do it. Well, and I, um, uh, my district is a fairly quiet district, and I have received a number of um, communications about this. Uh, and so, uh, representing my folks, I, I would be interested.
interested in taking this up. But then where would it go from here? Well, if we, if we, so if we took testimony, if we passed it out, um, it would go to the floor, uh, just as a bill, as Helen was saying, and then if it passed out of the House, then it would go to the Senate, just like a bill, and then if we passed it fully, then it would be this advisory um, message to Congress. I'm fair one way or the other. I think there should be checks and balances. Advisory stuff. I'd rather try to stick to stuff we got concerns with here in our state. That's what we're here for. And having said that, I, I, I'm not sure. It's okay. okay. Well, let's. I, I'm going to suggest that we, we think about this some more. Okay. Perhaps over the weekend. Is so, the homeless bill of rights on hold? Yes, I actually, uh, sorry, we've been so busy with floor stuff that I have not had a chance to circle back around on that. Um, I basically made a decision to put it back on the wall. Um, my concern was that we, um, you know, there were some questions, there's a lot of interest, there were also some questions, and it, it really felt as though we were running out of time. Um, that um, I, believe that there's enough interest that it will come back, and, um, but not this year. Okay. All right. 